D David, that was super. Just before you disappear, does anybody have a clarifying question for Dr. Rich? Or no? Well, with that, let's go on to our third and final speaker of the morning session, Mark Weisskopf. Uh, Mark is trained both as a neuroscientist at my alma mater, UC San Francisco, and then as an epidemiologist at Harvard, where he is now on uh, an associate professor in the School of Public, the T.H. Chan School of Public Health. So, uh, and he's going to talk to us about another relatively novel endpoint in the world of air pollution. Go, ahead, Mark. Great, thanks, Howard. And I'll see what I can do to try and catch up a little bit of time. But uh, yeah, so this is, I'm going to talk about both neurological and psychiatric effects of air pollutants in particulate matter. Uh, it, it is definitely a newer area of research. There is not a whole lot out there. Most of what I'm, all of what I'm going to talk to you about is ambient issues. Um, and there's not, th th this, you know, there's some areas that are growing somewhat faster, but it's a lot smaller than all of the other areas you've been, you've been hearing about. Um, so let me just start by saying why should we even think about uh, neurological or psychiatric effects of uh, particulate matter? Well, you heard in Ryan's talk about the, the cardiovascular link of, of particulate matter exposure, very well established. And frankly, there's a lot of interaction between the vascular system and the brain. Um, uh, this first bullet is what you heard from Ryan. But we uh, certainly find many vascular risk factors that are uh, associated with cognition or dementia. In fact, you know, everyone is quite familiar with Alzheimer's disease, but the other sort of form of dementia uh, generally thought of as vascular dementia, which is essentially a dementia that has some vascular component that's been found. Nowadays, there's a lot of overlap between these. It's not clear how distinct they are, but there's clearly vascular uh, contributors to that. Subclinical cerebrovascular disease is implicated in dementia. Subclinical cerebrovascular disease also um, seems to possibly play a role in late uh, life depression. There's a lot of uh, vascular risk factors that seem to be associated with, with later life depression. So there's clearly a vascular link with the brain that, that is quite important and we need to worry about. So it sets up, you know, why we should possibly be even thinking about issues with the brain. Um, so how, how would these things actually get there to have an effect on the brain? And I should say that, you know, we, we are at a severe disadvantage from the other areas that get talked about because you don't have easy access to the brain, right? We can't take samples from in there, and that's, that's a problem. It, you know, the vascular issues with cognition and dementia are, there's all these sort of risk factor overlaps, but um, just looking at markers of systemic inflammation, for example, the literature on cogn the relation to cognitive function is not very clear, and it doesn't seem like there's a strong relation there. But the brain has its sort of own inflammatory uh, events going on that, that may, in fact, be relevant. So, of course, the, the obvious way that everybody thinks about things getting into the body, the particles getting into the body, is via the lungs and, and then into the uh, systemic circulation. It might set off inflammatory effects that circulate and could potentially go to the brain. There's also um, some data suggesting that the particles themselves, or particularly smaller ones, can actually make their way there. But, but perhaps more worrisome and, and newer in our thinking here is that there may actually be a direct pathway to the brain. In fact, I should probably not even say may. I think it's reasonably well established at this point that things can get in there, and it's largely going directly through the olfactory <coughs> bulb, right? So you've got an aspect of your brain that is essentially sitting out in your nasal epithelium here that is sensing all the stuff that we smell, and that has direct input into the brain. So some things can, you know, get actually actively transported back, and other things like small particles can just sort of diffuse through, especially ultrafines. There's a big concern about, you know, we don't have less data there. Um, so this, this is what's sort of described here. Is that a laser pointer? Yeah. Um, and, and one of the issues with it, so here's the olfactory um, uh, neuroepithelium down here where things can sort of make their way back into the brain. And it, in fact, it's particularly relevant because the olfactory system has a, a sort of, you know, a hotline to very important centers of the brain involved in emotional regulation, involved, involved in memory. So it, it sort of has a direct connection to what we call the limbic system, which is vitally important in some of these sort of the older area of the brain. So it's kind of got quick access into areas that are quite relevant. And, and so this is garnered a lot of attention and gotten us worried about, um, about a much more immediate effect of things. So what happens once these things get into the brain? 
Um, what's sort of, on, you know, there's this nasal pathway. That, well, let's start with the respiratory. Over here, we can get the respiratory intake. There may be direct things going towards the brain, but certainly within systemic circulation, you can get possibly direct transport of particles that can either pass right through the blood-brain barrier or, in fact, cause reactions that make the blood-brain barrier leakier and not as efficient and so susceptible to other things. Um, that's the damage here. Uh, once you get inside there, you can, you know, there's evidence of altering neurotransmitter levels. You get all the sort of inflammatory type things that we think about systemically also will happen within the brain, right? And those things, of course, are bad for, for neurons. You get um, I, from either of these pathways, certainly from the olfactory bulb, you can get microglial activation, and microglia are the inflammatory cells of the brain. And those, you know, once you start activating those, you have deleterious effects on the neurons themselves. Um, what we also know is that all of these things I've boxed in red here, you know, are all these suggestive negative consequences of having exposure to the particulate matter, um, have, uh, are, are, you know, you see elements of these in different neurological, neurodegenerative, and psychiatric illnesses. So uh, it's certainly something to, to worry about. I'm going to talk mostly, obviously, about a lot of my own work in human populations, but there is, uh, there is animal work in this area, and it, you know, it is pretty dramatic. And I've shown you one of the more dramatic aspects here. This is out of Debra, Debra Corey Slechta's work in New York, exposing, um, I believe it was mice to, I can't remember, I believe it was mice to um, concentrated air particles. And this is soon, I think the, the exposure period was very soon postnatally. And what you're seeing on the top is a control mouse uh, and different sections of its brain. And this is a exposed mouse, different sections of the brain. And the dramatic difference is lateral ventricles, which is sort of the, you know, uh, where the cerebrospinal fluid, you know, sort of uh, circulates and, and is, is held largely, are dramatically increased in size in the exposed animals. So this clearly shows that, you know, there's a lot of stuff that leads to that, including neuronal death and things of that sort. So uh, th this is perhaps a more dramatic slide. I put it in here only to say that there is a lot of animal experiment in this area, and it's not always massive like this. You can also have sort of behavior, subtle behavioral effects that you see in these animals. So um, turning then more to the human work that, that we've been doing, um, sort of I've spanned the neurological uh, spectrum here. So I'll start on the early side. We've heard about reprodu potential reproductive and, uh, and birth outcome effects. So perhaps just a step beyond that is the development of the child. And autism has been in the news a lot, obviously. People are quite aware of it. Why do we think there might be a link with air pollution? Well, there's a lot of uh, animal and uh, other experimental evidence suggesting involvement of the inflammatory <laughs> system. So read this very recent paper on maternal interleukin uh, 17A pathways in mice promoting autism-like behaviors. Um, there, there's very interesting work. So I, so I should take an aside here for a moment to say that obviously sort of the neurons in the brain get all the press, right? They're, they're the things that do all the stuff we do. It has generally been dogma that the glial cells, which far outnumber the neurons, are kind of there as the scaffolding that the neurons are built on, right? Um, it's becoming more and more clear that the glia do a lot more than we thought, and they play a very active role in general, you know, neural communication. And in fact, very recently, one of the things that was found, um, when, when a, any uh, animal is born, they have an overproduction of cells and overproduction of connections between the cells. And it's those connections that ultimately will create our ability to do all the stuff we do. But there's this period of uh, experience-dependent learning where you sculpt the excessive connection back into an appropriate pattern to handle your environmental uh, inputs. One of the things in autism that we are pretty convinced has gone wrong is that sort of sculpting of the brain so that you have appropriate connections. So the connections don't form in, a, in an appropriately mature way. And what has recently been found is that um, the process of actually pruning back a neuron connecting to another neuron, so there's only neurons talking to each other, is actually carried out by the microglia in the brain. So they actually look for a particular target on a neuron synapse that is supposed to be removed, and they will go and they will grab it, right? So they play a very active role. But of course, they're also the ones that are responding to stressors like particulate matter. So um, as I said, all the work that I'm going to show you is dealing with ambient PM. So I apologize of not having been here yesterday and hearing everything. 
Um, so I'm going to hopefully not tread on stuff that was said or not said. But uh, just very briefly, this is the kind of way we approach this, right, is these models of based on ambient monitors of particulate matter. This happens to be a map of PM10. We take other factors into consideration, like the you know, meteorological factors, land use factors, and create sp a spatiotemporal map. This was work done by Jeff Yanoski and others at Harvard um, to produce this. And we've, we've linked this with our nurses cohorts and, and other uh, cohorts. Um, so we took this information, and within the Nurses' Health Study 2, a very large, uh, you know, over 100,000 women, we identified those that had children with autism and those that didn't, and we followed them up and, and did a little nested case control within, within this. So we're actually, in the end, talking about 250, 300 cases of autism and maybe 1,500 or so controls. But we know where the woman was when uh, she was pregnant, so we could assign particulate matter exposure based on our models to her residence at the time uh, of the pregnancy. So we looked at the pregnancy nine months before the pregnancy, nine months after the pregnancy, both PM 2.5 and PM 10. And this is a little bit busy and not all of it is relevant for what we're talking about. This is just, uh, I believe this is just PM 2.5 for an interquartile range uh, difference in PM 2.5 exposure. This is the first column, row rather is nine months before pregnancy, then the pregnancy period and nine months after the pregnancy unadjusted adjusted uh, results, and you can see an increased risk of autism or odds of autism in a mother with higher PM 2.5 exposure in any of these periods. But of course, particulate matter exposure is quite correlated across periods. So if you put them all in the model to try and tease out the independent effects, we find it very specific for the pregnancy period itself. And we went a little bit further than that and looked at the trimesters of pregnancy. I didn't show you PM10 in the other one. We don't see this with the larger fraction. This is PM10 minus PM2.5, but the PM2.5, we see an increased odds for autism for the third exposure during the third trimester. I won't go into it, but there, you know, both Ryan and, and Rich have talked about sort of methodological issues and epidemiological studies that are problematic, and I think they, there are particular ones that will rise to the fore in indoor air um, as opposed to outdoor air. But one of the things that, that we've written about is why seeing uh, time-specific effects of these kinds of things is very important from a causal perspective and from the epi uh, methods aspect of this. And we wrote a little review on the literature. This is both to say that um, this is not the only finding. There are, in fact, four or five different groups, and it is, is becoming quite consistent to see this association between perinatal, not ever, again, there's the issue of exactly when it's found, perinatal uh, higher particulate matter exposure and increased risk of autism in many different settings. Uh, a couple of them, our paper and uh, Amy Kalkbrenner's recent paper, have in fact looked very specifically at the third trimester and, or found association specifically with the third trimester, which I think has uh, in these important causal implications. So that's autism. What about other aspects of brain function? Um, we're interested in, um, I'm particularly interested having worked in a lab at one point on sort of emotional regulation, so things like anxiety and depression, but there's also the cognitive function. I mentioned that the olfactory nerve goes right into very critical brain areas for these types of functions. There, there are many reasons why this might happen. Of course, if you, you, know, you start activating microglia, you're going to start killing neurons, and obviously killing neurons is bad. But as I said, there's also this aspect of microglial activation that may have a very important role in, in synaptic communication. And so it's one thing during development, but it's certainly also true as you age, if you start you know, inappropriately removing synapses, activating microglia and taking them away, that very potentially can have effects on cognitive function and, and emotional regulation. So we were particularly interested in, in anxiety. To, to start, this is an area that actually hasn't received a whole lot of attention. We looked in the Nurses' Health Study 1 now. I mentioned that there's, you know, at least for uh, cognitive function depression, there's a lot of links between vascular uh, system effects and, and these outcomes. So we were interested for that reason. Um, we had in the Nurses' Health Study 1, so now we're talking about 70,000 or so women that we, you know, are assessed by questionnaire, but there are questionnaires on anxiety-type features. This happens to be one of them, the Crown Crisp Index uh, Phobic Anxiety index. And so we, you can look at this in many ways. You can sort of treat it as a, a, a sort of Poisson-like type thing or a negative binomial, or you can just say the people who are above a certain limit have high levels. There's some validation study suggesting this sort of is a clinically relevant cutoff. We have 15% at six or above. Um, and 
we looked again at our models of PM 2.5. We know when the nurse returns the questionnaire. So there are a lot of limitations here because we don't have great, great timing. But we know when she returns the questionnaire, the symptoms are asked about the last, I think, month or so or two weeks. I can't remember which now. But we looked at different periods. If we averaged for the month prior to returning the questionnaire, the year before returning it, or a, a long-term average over about five or no, that's even 15 years or so. And all of them seem to show some association with higher uh, odds of an anxiety, elevated anxiety. If we put a couple of these in the model together, so just the month before and, or the 12-month period, in fact, the 12-month period um, kind of goes away and doesn't really have much of an association where we see a pretty strong uh, linear one with the one month. So in fact, we're trying to push that. And, and the suggestion is it might be very recent or, you know, who knows, maybe daily even less might affect sort of anxiety levels. So we're interested in pushing that even further. Um, we've, there's, so that's the, this, this anxiety issue. Um, there's really not much else out on there. There's some controversial, not, not totally consistent work on depression that, that is out there as well. But this is quite new. Cognitive function itself it has received a little bit more attention. We've done some, several others have done it as well, both in kids and adults. And there's reasonable consistency that we see effects of PM, uh, particularly the smaller PM 2.5. Um, on cognitive function. This happens to be using maps of black carbon generated by Joel Schwartz's group. Um, we applied this in the normative aging study to, uh, which is a group of elderly men in the Boston area that have taken a variety of cognitive tests. And in fact, when we look at the mini mental state examination, which is actually a pretty crude assessment of cognitive function, it was designed more as a screener for dementia, um, but it turns out to be pretty useful in epi studies, um, you know, over adjusting for a variety of things. We, we see an increased risk of scoring low on an MMSC. We can also, we have a battery of different cognitive tests that these people do, so we can create a sort of global score from that. And that, too, seems to be worse with increased, uh, I think that was averaged over the, actually, that was taken in 1995, and they did their tests several years after that. That was an average from there. But as I said, there are several groups um, in Europe and in the US that have seen associations both in adults and and in children with cognitive function scores. People have done it based on home residents. The, Span the Spanish group, the Inman group, is also starting to look at um, PM levels and other uh, air pollutants at the school where the kids are as being very relevant for and, and, and seeing associations there as well. Um, as far as sort of frank clinical neurological outcomes, like, uh, say, an Alzheimer's disease, neurodegenerative, Parkinson's disease, other dementias, uh, that there's much less work on, but a few studies have looked at this. This is one by uh, our group and, and the postdoc Marianti Kiamorzoglu, who has uh, looked, taken large Medicare data and looked at the variation from year to year in uh, by city-specific uh, rates of Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or other dementias. Uh, based on the fluctuation by city of, of particulate matter. And in fact, for Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease and other dementias does see this increased risk. Now, this may not be incidence of these disorders. It may be the likelihood that you show up in the hospital. It may be slightly different. Um, there's, I think, one other study out of Sweden suggesting an association with Alzheimer's disease. The Parkinson's literature is a little bit more. There's a couple, some studies say yes, some studies say no. A recent publication, a uh, recent uh, poster at ISEE, Environmental Epi, suggested an association with um, ALS, actually. So we're interested in pursuing that as well. But this is, this is definitely much smaller in the literature. So in summary, I'll put this up here, right? We have many ways of getting to the brain, either peripherally or directly through this olfactory bulb. You know, and I haven't even talked about the stuff that could be carried in there, right? If you have a lead particle in there, that obviously can have other direct neuronal effects that are not good. Um, but all of these things can happen, and, and there are different ways of getting them into, into the brain to, to have potential effects. This is a great paper, by the way, uh, sort of summarizing this by Michelle Block and Lillian Calderon Garcia Duenas, who sort of to some degree got this started with some studies on dogs in Mexico City and, and brain effects. So let me just quickly then go back to the, the methods issue, because I think it is potentially a problem and, and an issue to, to pay attention to. You know, obviously, we think what's going on is that if something's happening, there's a personal air pollutant exposure that's affecting an outcome. But as, of course, in epidemiological studies, the big bugaboo is there may be something else related to both of those, right? Personal characteristics may affect how much you're exposed. 
may affect your, your outcome. We have a slight advantage in looking at ambient air pollutants outdoors because we tend to model them. And the fact of the matter is that the sort of inputs to this model are largely independent of personal behaviors and a lot of other factors that could be also related to disease. We tend to know what these inputs are. Socioeconomic status is one of them, but otherwise it's meteorological and things like that. And in sort of epicausal methods speak, um, that means that you're not going to have to worry about biases from these types of personal behaviors. If we're looking at indoor air pollutant estimates, of course, we think it's the same deal. It's got to be through personal exposures. But the problem is, are we in a setting where these personal behaviors may actually affect how we're measuring the indoor particulate matter? Um, I'm not sure. There may be ways to do it that gets you around this. And it's not like you can't do the study if this is going on. It just raises a lot of, uh, a, a lot of concern around bias issues that we have to pay attention to. And a little bit like the study, so Ryan mentioned one that he did that is very similar to what I'll say now, but I think it's something worth thinking about and, and pursuing with limitations he mentioned. This is work uh, from folks at Harvard, Joe Allen and, and Jack Spengler have been involved in this. But um, it's sort of akin to what Ryan explained on the removal, the, the filtering, but this is a whole setup in Syracuse where you literally can have an office space with people coming in and doing whatever tasks you want them to do, including cognitive function tasks or whatever uh, type thing you want. Admittedly, short term, that is a problem, as Ryan pointed out. You can't, we're not going to do this for Alzheimer's disease. Um, but cognitive function in the workplace, very important, so ought to think about it. And this is essentially the same kind of thing Ryan said, where you're able to manipulate the indoor environment and totally independently of the person sitting in the desk doing their work and at levels that they're not going to notice and affect different things. So you can have them doing tasks in a sort of randomized way. As Ryan was pointing out, you can kind of flip them, spend a week or a day doing, doing it under one condition, flip the condition, introduce the exposure, have them do it again. They don't know that. They're randomized to that. So you remove all of those potential confounders. So it's a very, very powerful type design. It's got limitations on what types of outcomes you can look at. So with that, I'll just thank the folks that actually really helped me do all this work, Ron and Raza, postdoc, uh, who's now back in Israel, and Melinda Power, who's down the street at George Washington, uh, did a lot of the cognitive function work, and, and Mariantiana Kiemortzoglu, who did the Medicare data work, and then my whole group at Harvard. So thank you very much. Thank you.